here's a quick video going over some examples for the complex solutions post-assessment. So the first one, a bird flies down towards the grass to catch a bug. The flight of the bird is modeled by the equation y equals 2x squared plus 10x plus 20. The surface of the grass is modeled by the x-axis. Uh, will the bird ever reach the surface of the grass? So um, without really like knowing exactly what this graph would look like, I'm just going to draw a quick sketch. So um, it is a like quadratic so we know it's gonna be a parabola like the u-shape and then the lead coefficient is positive it's a positive two so that means that the graph is going to be opening up so let's say it looks something like that um, we don't really know like what the exact points are how far down it goes how far up it goes but this is essentially like the um trajectory of the bird so like the bird flies downward it like swoops up it's like trying to get to the grass and then at some point it like flies back up we're just trying to figure out if it actually gets to the grass. And it says that the surface of the grass is modeled by the x-axis. So we're trying to see if our graph is going to hit our x-axis, which is good because we can use kind of our like solving techniques to figure out if there are going to be any real zeros of this function. And remember that like zeros and x-intercepts solutions, those all go together. So. Um, in order to figure out if there's going to be any like zeros or x-intercepts or anything, we're going to take our equation and to find the zeros, we are going to swap y out for zero. And then I'm just going to rewrite it. So it'd be zero equals 2x squared plus 10x plus 20. And then just keep in mind, like zeros mean like what x values make the function equal zero. So that's why we just like set the whole thing equal to zero and then solve for x because that'll give us the x values that make it work. So um, if we're solving this, um, since we have an equation, if there's a common factor, you can go ahead and divide that common factor out. Everything in this equation is divisible by two. So I'm going to go ahead and divide by two. Um, that's not like a mandatory thing, but it certainly can make the problem easier. So divide everything by two, and then this becomes zero equals just like a one X squared, but we don't write the one 10 X divided by two would become a five X and then 20 divided by two would become a 10. And then from there, we can check to see if it's factorable. Um, the lead coefficient is 1, so I would need numbers that multiply to 10 and add up to 5, which those don't exist, so it means it's not factorable. And then um, if it's not factorable, our options are completing the square or the quadratic formula. Uh, completing the square gets a little bit tricky when b is not even, so I don't want to complete the square here. I just am going to go ahead and use the quadratic formula. So we'll figure out what our a, b, and c are. A is the coefficient of x squared, so it's a 1. b is coefficient of x, so it's a, sorry, 5. And then c is 10, the constant. Okay, so our quadratic formula is x equals negative b, and then plus or minus square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. So... Uh, a is 1, so that'll go here and here. B is 5, that'll go here and here. And then C is 10, that'll go right here. So negative B is going to turn into negative 5, and then plus or minus the square root of B squared, so 5 squared. And then minus 4 times A, so times 1 times C, so times 10 over... 2 times a, so 2 times 1. And then I'll just kind of start simplifying the inside the radical. So negative 5 plus or minus the square root of 5 squared is 25. And then minus 4 times 1 times 10, so minus 40 over 2 times 1 is over 2. I'm going to start fresh down here. So negative 5, I can go ahead and subtract inside my radical now. Oops, that was supposed to be a minus 40, not a minus 10. Um, from the 4 times 1 times 10 that I've highlighted in yellow, so that's a minus 40. And then on the next line, it's negative 5 plus or minus the square root of, I can go ahead and subtract 25 minus 40. That gives me negative 15 over 2. And then if we wanted to simplify this radical, so um, like 15 does not have any perfect square factors, so we can't really simplify it, but we can take the square root of the negative factor, like we can take the square root of negative 1, which is i, and that'll be about as far as we can simplify it. So it'd be negative 5 
and then plus or minus i root 15, the 15 just stays inside the radical, over 2. So these are my zeros. I solved and I found those. And there's nothing wrong with them, but they have, they involve i. So that means that their complex solutions are zeros. And complex solutions don't actually um, show up as x-intercepts on the graph. Complex solutions are what we end up with if your graph, like your quadratic, does not cross the x-axis. So if we're not crossing or like touching the x-axis at all, that means that the in the context of this problem, the bird is not going to reach the surface of the grass. It's going to look kind of like the sketch I have over here, where it does like go down close to it, but it's not going to touch it. If it did, we would end up with solutions or zeros over here that were real. So they didn't involve I. Okay, so we could say, no, the bird will not reach the grass. Okay, so the next problem, Jessica and Sam both go for a run. They start off at the same location, but run in different directions at different speeds. Jessica goes east and Sam goes south. Um, Sam runs two miles per hour faster than Jessica. After running for 30 minutes, they're five miles apart. How fast does Jessica run? Okay, so a ton of information. Um, I will admit, like, these types of problems, these are tough. There's a ton of information thrown at you. I think it's really helpful to um, kind of draw a picture with all your information all in one place. So that's what I'm gonna do. So, so it says they both start at the same location. I remember like, um, as far as directions, like north, east, south, west, that's my little compass. Like um, if you learn like the never eat shredded wheat or like never eat soggy waffles, that's like the order of how I remembered it when I was younger. Um, but, so they're starting at a house, or they're starting at the same location, and then they go in different directions. One goes east, one goes south. So I'm going to say, like, this is where they're starting. And then, um, let's see. So Jessica goes east. So she's going this way. And then Sam goes south, so he's going down. And then after they run for 30 minutes, they're five miles apart. So that's talking about the distance between like where they end up. So if Jessica ends up like right here and Sam ends up right here, the distance between those two points is five miles. So this kind of like diagonal distance. So this is five miles. And then believe it or not, we actually like have enough information to figure out how fast they run, even though we don't like know a ton about like, I don't know what I'm trying to say here. Anyways, I was kind of getting ahead of myself. Um, okay, so we have enough information to find it, even if it doesn't feel like it at first. So what I want to do is I just want to spit as much information as I know on the table. So I'm going to make, or on the paper, so I'm going to make a little, like, kind of table with everything on there. So one row is going to be for Jessica. And then one row is gonna be for Sam. And then, let's see. So we know that Sam runs two miles per hour faster than Jessica. So we can kind of like describe their rate. So um, I'm gonna put rate right here. So I'll add another spot so I can kind of title each row or each column. So even though we don't like know the actual rate, we can write it in terms of variables. So Sam runs two miles per hour faster than Jessica. So I'm gonna call Jessica's rate J, and then Sam is gonna be J plus two. 
since he's two miles per hour faster than Jessica. And then the next one is we can talk about, we do know how long they run for, so we can put time. Um, so one thing we have to be careful about, so it says that they are running for 30 minutes, but their um, like rate or their pace is in terms of miles per hour. So we can't really talk about it in minutes. We have to talk about it in hours. So 30 minutes would be a half hour. So I'm going to make this half. And then this will be half also, since they're both running for 30 minutes. And then we can kind of calculate their like distance, not the actual number, but like in terms of variables. So there is a formula for um, distance, it's rate times time, right? So like if I'm traveling like at five miles per hour and I travel for one hour, I will have gone five miles. So um, distance, is rate times time. So for my last one, I'm gonna put distance and I don't, I don't have like an actual number distance, but I can write it in terms of variables. So it's rate times time. So for Jessica, I can do J times one half or one half J. And then for Sam, it's j plus two times a half, so I'm gonna do one half, and then parentheses j plus two, and that's my distance. So now my goal is to figure out like their rate, or at least Jessica's rate, and that's the variable that I've defined here, is Jessica's, like her rate is j. So if I can figure out a way to set up an equation and solve for j, that'll give me Jessica's rate. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the picture and there's not a ton of information on there, but this, the picture, like the triangle I set up, it has to do with like the distances. So like the diagonal is like the five mile distance. And now we kind of have a way of describing Jessica and Sam's like horizontal and vertical distance. So Jessica was one half J. So I'm just gonna add that up here. And then for Sam, Sam was one half J plus two. And then now I like kind of have the sides in a triangle. I'm working with one variable only, like J is my only variable. So if I only have one variable, it means I only need one equation to be able to solve for it. And you can see from the picture that we're dealing with a right angle and we have a formula that helps us find sides or work with sides of a right angle, it's Pythagorean theorem. So remember Pythagorean theorem is A squared plus B squared equals C squared where A and B are the two legs. So it would be like Sam's side and Jessica's side and C is the hypotenuse. So that would be like my five miles. So we can go ahead and take like our one half J, one half J plus two. Um, I forgot the parentheses around the one half or the J plus two. So I'm gonna go ahead and add those, my bad. Um, but we like have enough information here to set up an equation and solve for J. So. Um, you can go ahead and take each of these and plug them in as is, so like one half j plus two or like one half j. Um, but I don't really want to deal with the one half, so I'm going to do something a little bit different. Um, I actually think before I do that different thing, I'm going to just go ahead and like distribute the one half. So it'd be like one half j, one half times two would be like plus one. So I'm going to use that instead because that'll make my life a little bit easier in a second. So we just distributed the one half inside the parentheses. Okay. And then now if I don't want to deal with the one halves because I don't want to like have to like square and boil with fractions, um, triangles are like proportional. So if I just go ahead and like double this every single side, that's going to keep like the same value for J. I can just like double each side length or I can multiply each side length by any like consistent number and the value for J will stay the same. So what I mean by that is I'm going to take like if I take one half J and I just multiply it by two, that just becomes regular J because two times one half is one. And then I'm just going to, you just have to do the same thing to each side. As long as you're multiplying each side by the same amount, it keeps it proportional. So if I do this times two, that would be J plus two. 
And then instead of five, I would have to multiply the five by two. So I'd become 10. So I'm gonna use all the ones that are boxed and in red as my side lengths um, instead of the ones with one half. And just because I multiply them all by the same number, it just keeps it proportional. Um, so it doesn't really impact like the value of j at all. Okay, so now that'll give me better numbers to use for Pythagorean theorem. So I'm gonna put j in where a is. So a, sorry, j squared. And then um, j plus two is gonna go in for b. So plus j plus two squared. And then equals um, c is 10, the hypotenuse, so equals c, uh, 10 squared. Okay, and then uh, right here we have a binomial squared. So unfortunately I can't like just distribute the power. I have to like expand it and foil it. So I'm gonna bring down this j squared and then this is gonna be j plus two times j plus two equals uh, 10 squared, so 100. And then I need to foil um, this part right here. So I'm not gonna go through each step. It's just if I were to foil that, it would be j squared plus four j from the outer and inner for foil and then plus four equals 100. And then now I can work on getting it in standard form and deciding how I want to uh, solve it. So I have these like terms. I can combine those. So j plus j is 2j squared. Or sorry, j squared plus j squared is 2j squared. Um, I'm going to bring down my 4j because that is not a like term with anything. So that's a different exponent. And then I can also just go ahead and subtract over this 100 from the four, because those are constants, so those are like terms. So four minus 100 is negative 96 equals zero. And then um, I have like a common factor that I can divide out that would make my life easier. Everything's visible by two. So I'm gonna divide everything by two. And then I'm gonna bump it up here, probably have to write kind of small, but um, two J squared would become just J squared plus two J. And then minus 96 divided by 2 is negative 48 equals 0. And then from here, you can decide how you want to solve it. You can factor it. You can use the quadratic formula. It is entirely up to you and what you feel like doing. Um, this is factorable, so that I am going to factor it. Um, the lead coefficient is 1. So I just need numbers that multiply to negative 48 and add up to 2. So those two numbers would be um, six and eight. I just need to make the eight positive and the six negative to get them to multiply to negative 48 and add up to a positive two. Okay, so factors into j plus eight times j minus six equals zero. And then I would set each factor equal to zero this would become j plus eight equals zero and j minus six equals zero. And then if I um, subtracted the eight over, I would get j equals negative eight. And if I added the six over, I would get j equals positive six. So um, those are like the two solutions. Obviously one only makes, only one of them makes sense in the context of this problem. Because if you go back to our table, we use j to represent Jessica's rate so how fast she was running um i don't she can't run a negative pace or rate so our j equals six is going to be our actual solution so we can say that jessica runs six miles per hour so jessica runs six miles per hour and then we're on to the last one Okay, so the last one is expand um, i plus three to the fourth power. So expand means that we are like raising, raising it to the fourth, and then um, we're just gonna end up having to foil a bunch of times. There is a little bit different way to go about this, but um, I'm not sure how frequently it's gonna come up. So it's more one of those things that kind of takes maybe more time than it's worth. Um, so, but if you're interested in like looking up the alternative method, um, it would be binomial, this is like what you would look up, but binomial expansion using Pascal's triangle. And if you've ever seen Pascal's triangle, it's just like a pattern 
this is a really cool thing. It's just like I said, it, we don't have a ton of time in class to do it, and I would rather shift focus onto other stuff. Okay, so here we're just going to kind of do it the long way and foil it. So um, I plus 3 to the 4th, so it would be I plus 3 four times. So times I plus 3, times I plus 3, times I plus 3. And when I have like four binomials like this, I just like to foil two at a time. Um, it's really hard to do it all in one step, so I'm just going to separate those, do those two, and I'll do the other two together as well. Okay, so... Um, I times I for the first is I squared, and then this is I times 3, so that's 3I, and then this is another 3I, though, so I'm just going to add those together right now. Um, so 3I plus 3I would be 6I, and then for the last, 3 times 3 is plus 9. So I'm going to leave that in parentheses, and I'm going to repeat that same process over here. But if you notice, it's like, it's the same thing. It's another I plus 3 times I plus 3. So it's going to foil the same way. So I'm just going to copy it instead of foiling it again. So I squared plus 6I and then plus 9. And then now we have like 3 terms th times 3 terms. And um, the idea stays exactly the same. It's a little bit more tedious. So um, basically what we're going to do is take the I squared and distribute it to all three of these terms over here and then we'll just kind of move down the line. So I squared times I squared is I to the fourth power. I squared times 6I would be 6I cubed. I squared times 9 would be 9I squared. And then I'm going to move down to the 6I, distribute that to like all three things in the second parentheses. So 6i times i squared would be 6i cubed. 6i times 6i would be 36i squared. 6i times 9 would be 54i. And then next is the 9. Then I'm going to go ahead and distribute to all three terms as well. So 9 times i squared is 9i squared. 9 times 6i is 54i. And then 9 times 9 would be plus 81. We'll go ahead and combine like terms. So I just have um, this 1 out of the 4th power, so I'll bring that down. And then I have a 6i cubed plus 6i cubed. And then that looks like those are my only i cubed. So those would be together 12i cubed because you would just add the coefficients. And then um, I look like I missed an i squared right here, there should be one, um, just to kind of backtrack really quick. So this was like this term, 9i came from i squared times 9. So that should have been a 9i squared. Okay, so um, now moving on to my like i squared terms. So I have 9i squared, 36i squared, and another 9i squared. Um, I don't want to mess it up by trying to do it in my head, so I'm just going to 9 plus 36 plus 9 is 54. So plus 54i squared. And then we have our like i to the first power terms. So 54 plus 54 is 108i. And then plus 81. And then just remember that you can't have like any i powers left in your final answer. So we would use that like simplifying powers of i table so um i to the first power is just i i squared is negative one i to the third power is negative i and then i to the fourth power is a positive one so i to the fourth power just gets replaced with positive one and then plus 12 times i to the third power gets swapped out for negative i plus 54i squared um, is negative 1, so we swap those out. And then plus 108i, uh, i the first power is fine, it just stays as is, you can't simplify it anymore. And then now we'll just uh, kind of multiply and simplify each piece. So 1 and then 12 times negative i, so minus 12i. 54 times negative 1, so minus 54, and then bring down the plus 108i plus 81. 
And then I'm going to combine my real parts. So 1 minus 54 plus 81. So 1 minus 54 plus 81 is 28. And then combine my imaginary parts. So negative 12i and 108i. Just need to add the coefficients. So negative 12 and 108 is 96i. So plus 96i. So 28 plus 96i. And then just remember to write the real part first, the part that does not involve i, and then the part with i second.